The next speaker, Professor Eric Miller from University of Toronto, is currently Director of the University of Toronto Transportation Research Institute, Director of Data Management Group, Director of Traveling Modeling Group. He has contributed significantly in many fields in our transportation, and in particular in the interaction between humans, urban uh, land use, transportation, and the environment. Eric has been in the scientific committee of almost all IATBR conferences since 1991. He was a member of the jury Eric Pass Pri for the Eric Pass Prize between 2001 and 2003, and of course the chair uh, of the Eric Pass Prize in 2003, member of Lifetime Achievement Award uh, jury for the 2012, executive member of the IATBR to, from 2006 to 2013, vice chair 2006 to 2007, chair 2008 to 19. He organized the conference in Toronto in 2012. Please welcome Eric Miller. Thanks so, thanks so much, David. Well, it's, it's my great pleasure to be here. And as Tommy sort of said, we really didn't get much chance to say thank you last night and, uh, uh, and to express just how important this award is to both of us, I think, and, and well, I know. Um, and you know, in particular, I think there's nothing better than recognition of your peers, and that's what this is all about. And uh, I'm just gonna inflict a very short story on you to illustrate that. When I was 13 years old, I, for the one, once and only time in my life, I got a chance to go away for a sleepaway camp for two weeks to a Boy Scout camp and I, I was a very shy quiet little kid but I, I really enjoyed it and at the at the end of the two weeks there was a secret vote among all the campers to elect the most valuable camper and I expected my patrol leader who was very gregarious and outgoing and a, a veteran of the camp to win it and to my total surprise I, I won the most valuable uh, camper award and what you got was a little purple bead it was it was a legendary purple bead it was uh, you know just some bead they dipped in some purple ink um, a little other thong but it, it just meant the world to me because you know uh, all these 13 and 14 year olds had, had seen something in me. Uh, well, this this award is my second purple bead. I, uh, it, it really uh, it, it really validates and, and, and makes all all that work worthwhile. So th thank you, thank you very much. Um, I also think it's interesting that Tommy and I are sort of now linked together and uh, as, as co-winners of this award because because uh, you know he's a psychologist, I'm an engineer. He's interested in fundamental theory, and I'm interested. In, I'm very interested in theory, and I'm going to talk a lot about theory, uh, but I'm interested in, in taking that theory into application, into models. I, I really am a modeler, um, and, and so I actually want to look forward, I want to look ahead uh, and talk about where I think travel demand modeling is going or perhaps needs to go, and in particular I think the prerequisites uh, to move to a next generation of travel demand models. I mean, Beba, I missed it, I wasn't here, gave a, a, a great retrospective and, and a discussion of where we've been coming from, and, and you know, we've had great accomplishments in our field, I think we can be very proud, but I think, I think we, we, we need to, uh, you know, we're always trying to move forward, and so that's, that's what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, so very, very briefly, I want to talk about some of the disruptions that are challenging us, I think we know all about them, that are, you know, forcing us, even, even if we, uh, for other reasons, didn't, thought our models were okay, uh, I, I think they're not okay going forward because of these disruptions. Uh, I want to set the stage for, for what I'm going to talk about in terms of what I see as the four pillars that support travel demand modeling, uh, and then I want to focus on three of those, theory, data, and computing. Um, and again, this is going to be very much a talk from, from a modeling point of view. Uh, I've always had at least one foot in, in sort of the real world of application. And, and uh, part of what this underlies this is my frustration with taking theory into practice and how I think our models, our models specifically have to, have to do better. Um, so we, uh, you know, and, and I don't have to say much. This whole conference is about AVs, mobility of services. Everybody's in this field. Every, everybody sees uh, sees this coming. The technology, the services are changing. Uh, it, it, it's totally disrupting transportation, but it's also uh, posing huge challenges to our travel demand models that have always been built on the same old, same old, the status quo. And I think there's there's a huge challenge going forward. In my uh, my view, our current models we're using them because they're the best tools we have, but they're really not yet 
prepped, ready to take on uh, you know, the, the future, and part of the challenge is the future is so unknown, uh, and how do we deal with that uh, in, in our models. Uh, fortunately, so, so, so part of what's driving that uh, in this disruption, of course, is, is the Internet of Things, uh, the explosion of uh, ICT, uh, smartphones, et cetera, uh, big data. Um, and and that's, that's driving the change, but it's also good news for us in terms of it's creating an entire new, brave new world of data, uh, completely different kinds of data, requiring completely different kinds of analysis methods, and perhaps in, uh, implying very, very, very different models. And I think we're at, in a bit of an existential crisis, not crisis, but a challenge, uh, in, in that we've always been very econometric based. Uh, you know, we have one style of model building, and now with machine learning, et cetera, et cetera, coming along, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's different paradigms out there. I, I, I think these can be very mutually reinforcing, and I think it's really exciting. But it, again, it's, it's disrupting our, our, our usual way of thinking. Um, and a third one, which I don't think we've talked much about here, but I think is, is just, just import, huge, is the global urbanization process that's been going on uh, for the last 100 years or more. Is continuing. We all, I think we all know that there's more than 50% more than of the world's population lives in cities. Uh, but these are huge challenges, and that growth is going to continue, particularly in Africa, parts of Asia, uh, et cetera. The emergence of me uh, almost any, every day there's a new mega city. Uh, many, 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 many challenges there, but transportation is, is a central one. Uh, I always say you can't talk about cities, any policy in cities, without getting to talking about transportation within the first five minutes. And, and, and to me, this is a huge first order problem that if we don't get transportation right and we don't get urban form right uh, it's going to be hard to get everything anything else right and, and whether you're talking about economics um, social social inequity political uh, uh, political unrest uh, again many sources of that but part of it is how we build our cities and and so I, I think ultimately we're all here interested in travel behavior and, and building our models but I think we're all we're always doing that be, the engineer says we're building Building tools to help us and understanding and help us to understand and design the cities of the future. And, and to me, that's, a, that's an enormous challenge, I think, but it, I think it's a very exciting one, but it's one I think we have to take very seriously. Um, so in terms of, you know, want to build a model, how do you build a model, what do you need? Well, you need data, you need theory, you need methods, which I would separate from the models per se, and you need you need computing. Uh, and by methods, I mean the analytical techniques, the econometrics, the the AA. But also, to me, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about that. You know, a logit model, random utility theory. I think is largely a methodological approach to the problem within which we then pour theory. And I'll try to differentiate that a bit. Uh, uh, and and obviously, our theory. Uh, you know, there's a classic scientific uh, <coughs> two-way flow of of induction. We observe we observe the world around us, which we we need data to do. Uh, out of that emerges, uh, we, we try to generalize from, uh, uh, from, uh, from what we see, uh, get, get some theories, and then we go back deductively and test those theories against, against data. And um, to me, models are, are the operational implementation of theory. One way, a major way we test theory is through models. Um, and we're always limited in terms of both our theory and our models of what we can do by the data we have, uh, by the methods we have to analyze the data, build the models, implement them, and, and the computing power. And I want to talk about theory data and, and computing a bit more. Because um, I, think, I think where we're strongest is in our methods. I think we have tremendous methodological capability um, uh, to apply to our data, to our theories. Um, and so this, to a certain extent, a starting point, uh, I teach a course in cities as complex systems these days, and, and uh, Donella Meadows was, a, was a, a, a brilliant systems dynamicist. She was a, uh, a colleague uh, of, of Jay Forrester who invented system dynamics. Um, I think a very deep systems thinker. I'd recommend her book, very accessible to anybody who wants to think about systems, uh, which should be all of us. Uh, but this is a quote from her, and, and my starting point is, is exactly what's in red, that we know so much, and yet we know so little. And, and uh, we can't rest on our laurels, and we have to be, be really pushing the frontiers, I think, of our knowledge if we're going to be addressing the challenges and disruptions I briefly talked about. Um, you know, and again, I, 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 uh, uh, you know, random utility theory uh, has been the, the, the foundation of so much of what we've been doing uh, for so many years. I mean, it's a huge success story. You know, Friday is going to be a, a day dedicated to Daniel McFadden very, very appropriately in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the 
what we've been able to accomplish with random interrupt theory, but at the risk of having every discrete choice model in the room stone me at the end of the, the discussion, I would say it's almost only the starting point from a theoretical point of view. To me, it's, it's a framework, it's, a, it's a, again, it's sort of more methodological. It, 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 it describes a decision process, but it assumes you have a utility function, it assumes you know the choice set, it, it, it assumes you know the constraints. So I think there's a, a lot of sort of uh, what, why, and when uh, in terms of our theoretical understanding, the discrete choice theory is just kind of silent about, it, and we have to bring that, to bring that to in, into the into the uh, into the equation, and, and that's what I'm really interested in is is how we we, we fill in and, and work within that extremely powerful set of methods uh, to get better actual behavior representations. Um, and, and certainly from a modeling point of view, I think this, this is a problem. I mean, we, we, we don't have uh, standard specifications. Values of time, we still don't really, you know, values of time vary all over the place. This is a concept we have. Every time I estimate a model, even in Toronto, I get a different value of time and I have to rationalize it. Uh, we're, we still struggle with what our social, socioeconomic specifications are. By and large, we tend to put the variables we have in our data into the model and try to make them work. But are we, do we have the right variables? Do we have standard socioeconomic specifications? I, I, I bang the drum all the time about spatial choice, location choice. The dirty little secret in operational models is our, desti our loaded destination choice models do a, a, not a very good job of predicting where people are going to shop or even work uh, because there's a lot of, a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of unknowns there. Um, you know, even mode, route choice, location choice, what, what, what order do people actually make these decisions in? We have all sorts of different models and all sorts of different things we test. Um, our, our, whether we're talking about trips or activities, uh, at the episodes, our generation models are still just, you know, very, typically very simple, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, to to totally statistical thing. There's a probability you go to work today. Well, why are you going to work? Can is there is there any underlying, uh, um, real underlying theory there? Um, and I, 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 one that I think is extremely important is is our models are still very very static. Um, and, and there's very strong equilibrium assumptions almost. And getting dynamics into the model, which we think is very important, is that if we want to have learning and adaptation, uh, you know, I think in terms of autonomous vehicles, and mobility services, and so on, people are learning how to use these systems. There's, there's, there's adaptation going on. Uh, I, I, our models, I think, are too static to really capture that. Um, and certainly in the modeling field, uh, Richard Soberman was one of my, was the men, is my mentor. I, he's the reason I'm here. I wandered into an undergraduate course he was teaching and um, you know, it's been transportation ever since. And if he was here, which uh, whenever I say this, when he's around, he says, Miller, you have to stop blaming me for this. Uh, but um, you know, uh, in, in the modeling profession out there where you actually build models and it's mainly consultants, uh, he always talked about there's a big difference between 30 years of experience and one year's experience repeated 30 times. In other words, it, professionally in operation, we keep applying the same old models over and over and over again, uh, and we don't really learn from them because I tell my students models should be a hypothesis test. I mean, that's what, you know, you, you, you run the regression or the maximum likelihood estimation and you get t-statistics out. Well, the t-stat is a, is a hypothesis test, right? It's a, it's a parametric test on whether that parameter makes sense or not. So we sh every time we build a model, we should be learning things. We're testing hypotheses. But if it's the same model and if we're just beating it to death with calibration to make it fit the screen line counts, well, how much are we really learning? Um, and, and, and so I think it's incredibly important, and one of the reasons that happens is, is the consultant always has to put the model together very quickly because it's part of a planning study, and, and you only have a few, few weeks or months to do something. So modeling as an exercise really has to get offline from operational practice so we have the, the luxury, the time to do some testing. Uh, another colleague of mine, Ezra Hauer, was an extremely uh, world famous uh, uh, road safety researcher. He really brought statistical rigor I think to the road safety field in many ways. Uh, you know, we had a PhD defense once and you know, we had a mode choice model or something and you know, some of the parameters weren't that great because then we said, well, we have a small data set and, and he just sort of shook his head and says, you know, do you guys ever reject a model? Um, because you know, if you reject the model, you don't publish the paper, right? So every model has to be a success, so you get the paper published in transportation research or whatever. Um, so, but but you know, presumably science uh, proceeds through negative results as well as positive ones. We often learn more by finding out what what doesn't work. 
um, and, and yet, you know, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to publish negative results. So, so arguably, if we want to be more scientific about either theory or models, maybe we should actually reject a model once in a while. Or, or we say, you know, yeah, okay, that model's okay, but this, you know what, this is a better model. You know, you know Smith, Smith got this model. Uh, Jones has this model. You know what's a better model? Maybe we should use Jones's model, uh, but but I don't think we do enough of that. Um, and and then uh, Jeffrey West, who is a former president of Santa Fe Institute, and I'll say more about him in a couple of minutes. I uh, was once actually in in Chile uh, at a really lovely conference that Francisco Martinez had uh, organized, and uh, we're talking about models. And I said, yeah, you know, you know, to say a remote choice model, you know, we have 20, 30, 40, 100 parameters, and and Jeffrey just just uh, you know. Uh, as I say, he, he almost dropped his fork and, and he literally said, good God, do you call that science? Uh, because for him, you know, to have more than one parameter in the equation that explains everything is, you know, that's, that's his goal. So obviously there's something in between, but I think there is, there is a point that we, we do, uh, um, uh, if you need a million parameters to explain what's going on, maybe that's not a very parsimonious theory. And of course, now that we're getting to machine learning where we have millions of parameters that we don't understand, maybe, maybe that's getting even worse. Um, so, I, you know, I think we have a really, really tough problem that we're dealing with. Travel behavior uh, is extremely heterogeneous. It's extremely multidimensional. Um, it's a consumer good, but it's, you know, toothpaste. It doesn't really matter where the toothpaste is being consumed, but, but travel, you know, every trip from from one point in space to another point in space at one point in time for one purpose by one type of person, it's a very heterogeneous differentiated good, so yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, and getting data about that is tough. So I think we have a, a real challenge with us. It isn't always appreciated outside of our field just how, how difficult the problem is. I, I, over the years, I found it somewhat amusing when people wander in from some other discipline or some other uh, area and they, they think, you know, oh, this, these travel behavior modelists, uh, they're not really very bright because they haven't solved the problem yet. Uh, you know, six months and we'll, you know, I'm thinking of some particular people who live out in the American <laughs> desert who used to stimulate tank movements in the Persian Gulf and things, and when they came to take over, you know, start working in the modeling field, they figured it'd take six months and they could move on to modeling tank movements again or something. Well, they discovered it was actually a tougher problem than they thought. It's, it, it is a challenge. Um, but I think we need, uh, but, but, but the real point I want to make here is, is because it's complicated, we do tend to express our hypotheses in terms of a specific model uh, with specific variables and then we test it or a model structure. Um, and, and as soon as you do that, you are framing what you're going to find to a certain extent. Um, you know, if, if the data have to fit into this structure, uh, you know, it's going to do the best you can. And, and, and I mean, we can learn things from that, but I think we have to be very, very careful about how we frame and structure the problem, our investigations, so that we are open to be, dis to be um, um, surprised by the data, uh, and we're not sort of force-fitting uh, the, the, the results into a specification. Um, and this becomes very important, I think, as we build very complicated model systems uh, that, that we may be straightjacking things. So I think we have to be very open to experimentation, testing new things. There's a whole, you know, I've talked at other times about the my model syndrome, the, you know, again, my model's the best. Uh, and, and it's very difficult for us to converge and maybe uh, work in a field, and I'll talk a bit more about this, or in a way that actually allows us to explore specifications in ways that maybe we don't do it now. Um, you know, I just have a, a, a shopping list, I don't have time, but just to illustrate, I think there are many important behavioral theoretical questions that we do not have good, uh, as good understanding as we should have, uh, both from a, just a pure scientific behavior point of view, but these are all very practical things from a modeling point of view, and uh, you know, that uh, we would it'd be nice to have, be able to do better about some of these things. I've just highlighted dynamics, spatial choice, and you know, and the actual utility of travel or activity, uh, you know, beyond just that travel time is, is, is bad and travel cost is bad. Um, and you know, I, I, in my own work, um, uh, you, you know, we've been trying to start with some propositions, uh, not, I hesitate to quite call it theory, but, you know, st st start with some conceptual frameworks, and then we work to methods. So we never start by saying, oh, let's apply a nested logic model to this problem. We say, well, what's the problem? What's the decision process? What variables do we have? How, what do we think the process is? And then, oh, you know what? Maybe the nested logit is a good way to operationalize that. But, but uh, you know, I, 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 again, part of what I think what I'm trying to say is, you know, there's the old, 
if you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. Uh, in uh, our own work with our students, we try not to pick up the hammer or the screwdriver right away. We try to figure out first, do we need the screwdriver or do we need the hammer? Um, and, but, but you know, if we look at that list, uh, what it's kind of saying is let's take travel behavior seriously, that we really, to build good models, we really need to be good behavioral theorists, uh, you know, uh, behavioral scientists, if we're going to get good policy sensitive models. Um, uh, my second provocation is maybe a bit surprising. I've spent the last 30 plus years telling everybody that micro simulation is the way to build models, uh, and for all sorts of really good reasons. Um, and I, I still believe that, and I don't think micro simulation, uh, we've made tremendous progress, and, and the whole because of the heterogeneity in our field and, our, and the need to model context, et cetera, et cetera, we ha we, the, our history has been one of uh, relentless disaggregation that inevitably leads us to micro-simulation as, as the mode of implementation. And, and, and I, I think part of our success in our field is that we have actually adopted that. And with, as computing power grows, we've been able to, to you know, I think very successfully build very, very successful operational micro-simulation models. But there are a lot of statistical and other issues associated with these models um, that, you know, and nothing's perfect. But I, even as I've uh, always told my students, we're testing the microsimulation hypothesis at the back of my head. I don't think I've ever really written this anywhere, but I've always said to myself and sometimes my students, is that it is a hypothesis. And maybe it's, uh, this, this relentless disaggregation is, just represents a practical engineering approach to the problem, if you will, of this is the best we can do with our theory and our methods and our data to get at the moment. And the question is, uh, is there maybe a more parsimonious, holistic approach that we should be should be looking at? Uh, you know, and certainly Michael Wegner, who's uh, in, in my view the, the dean of land use models and and um, and uh, early proponent of micro simulation methods in land use modeling in Germany, always warns about the Spitfire syndrome in that everybody likes a Spitfire. So you start off to build a model of a Spitfire, but then you you know you want the ailerons to uh, move up and down, you want the tail to wag, and you want the propeller to go around, and you want a little pilot in there, and you want some duck, and so eventually you keep adding detail and detail and detail and detail until you end up with a, having a Spitfire, not a model. Um, and that's, that's presumably not what we want to do. So, so there is, uh, there's the peril of ever increasing desegregation. Part of the art of the field is, is you know, put detail where you need it and, and make it simpler where, where, where you don't need it. Um, but, but the more general point is, as I say, we've, we've been following uh, relentlessly this reductionist approach to the problem, but is there a, a holistic approach? And, uh, uh, has nothing to do with transportation, but Goodell Escher Bach was a very famous book by a computer scientist really talking about artificial intelligence. You know, and, and the thing is, do you model the ants running around or do you model the anthill? And we've been modeling ants. Uh, you know, are there models of anthills out there that we should be thinking about? And I think, again, another disruptive theoretical challenge to us is the area of city science, uh, complexity theory applied to cities. Um, we, we see, uh, again, Jeffrey West, Santa Fe Institute, uh, that. Um, we, uh, we see these macro emergent scaling properties of cities that seem to occur that bigger cities uh, consistently behave in a certain sort of way. In particular, we, we see that there's this sort of super linear agglomeration effect that, that as population grows, anything to do with the economy, uh, economic outputs or intellectual outputs, patents, everything, grows in a super linear way. And the argument is that's why big cities are more productive and, and, and more attractive and are growing relative to small cities. Um, and, the, the, and, and this starts as just a totally empirical observation. Just get data, plot it, run the regression, you get an R squared of 0.9, and you say, gee, there's something here. Um, then, but the real question is, what's the theory underlying that? And particularly from our point of view, what does transportation behavior have to do with this? And Louis Battencourt, who's, who's Jeffrey West's uh, colleague, argues, in fact, that it's all about social networks. And it's about the fact that we all are interacting. In bigger cities, there's more, there's more chances that you're interacting. Uh, so that really should have something to do with transportation. Um, you know, and, and, and does our understanding of behavior actually help perhaps explain or, or perhaps debunk, not everybody believes the scaling laws, uh, what's going on. Um, you know, I think this ties into questions of accessibility, agglomeration, which I also think we take for granted, but we don't understand the mechanisms of, you know, you know I work in integrated transportation land use modeling. We talk about the feedback we can transportation land use, but we really don't understand yet the dynamics and the long run effects of how day-to-day -day travel really feeds back and influences long run decisions. Um, 
And, 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 and uh, another example of this is, is in other fields, like in traffic engineering. I'm fascinated, for my sins, one of the things I've had to do is teach undergraduate traffic engineering once in a while. Uh, so I actually learned something about it. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we have micro car following models that says, given where a car is at this instant in time, what's it going to do in the next instant in time? Um, and a really interesting thing is that, you know, under certain assumptions, um, we can actually integrate that, that totally micro, di totally dynamic, second by second, tenth of a second by second second model, integrated to get the steady, solve for the steady state, you know, average conditions, and lo and behold, we get the fundamental flow diagram. Uh, a traffic flow diagram out of that. And I find that extraordinarily powerful because there is that direct linkage between the micro and the macro. Uh, and I think that validates both models, I, given that the macro model, which is you know, ultimately sort of empirically based, uh, uh, can be supported by an underlying theory, uh, micro theory, and the micro theory aggregates up to that, and that's extraordinarily powerful. And I, I just wonder whether we have something similar in transportation. Again, coming back to scaling uh, and land use, as another example of this, Mark Francis Martinez uh, has a paper out a couple years ago now uh, showing that he can actually take his more or less micro uh, bid choice model of a land market and, and, and create a super linear scaling pro uh, relationship between average rent in a city and the population size. So this is another example where starting at the micro level, you can actually uh, aggregate up to get a macro result, which again, I think is powerful. And it's just a very simple little example. We, we've been running probit models for 15 years now in Toronto uh, at the mode choice level, tour mode, mode choice, where we hypothesize a, a utility at the triple level, and we simply add them up to get the tour, the tour utility, and it's got to be probit because we have to add the error terms, um, you know, they, the probit adds up. So this is just another example where we start with something a little more micro, get something a little more macro out of it analytically. And so I guess I'm just trying to say, is, is this something we should be thinking more about? I'm, I think I'm running short of time. Uh, data, uh, uh, I, I, I think, again, we're facing a huge challenge, uh, opportunity and challenge with all the new data sets we have. Uh, we've always been a very empirically driven field, but I think we've always been extraordinarily limited in what we view. Small samples, uh, not knowing how to get out latent variables, uh, static cross-sectional data, and so forth. And so, um, uh, and, and, and so, and we've been modeling a typical day as if that was something that was real. Um, and, and I think, again, the data limitations, which we always blame our, the limitations our models on, uh, is probably not unique to our field, but you can certainly look at other fields like health, where they have serious money, and although they don't think so, and, and serious money, and you know, huge longitudinal panel surveys. Uh, I, I don't know how it is here in Canada. They, they link health records to income tax records. I mean, there's no way we could get that information, at least we don't think so. So why do they get it? Maybe health's important, transportation's not. Uh, but I, I, I think we, we, we should stop take it, using data as an excuse for, for, for limited models. And of course, the big data sets are, are really challenging us, changing us, uh, and, and what's, what's possible to do. Huge challenges, huge issues there. Uh, but, but again, I think we have to be open to what might be possible with that. Uh, finally, and even more briefly, perhaps, computing. We've, we've always been uh, captive. We've been creatures of the computing, of computing power. Our field, certainly travel, dem travel demand modeling, came into existence with the, with the emergence of the IBM 360 computer in the mid-50s. We couldn't do what we do without a computer. And what we can do has always been tied in lockstep to, to the both hardware and software available to us. Um, and, and, and so computing is just critical to what we're trying to do. The computer is clearly our lab. In some ways, it's almost more our lab than, than the real world because we can simulate in the computer things that we can't observe or it's very difficult to observe. I would argue uh, that as a profession, as a field, we probably haven't made as much use of, uh, of really advanced computing um, as, as many other fields. And, and, and I think we've, again, been bound a bit by not being as aggressive in, in cloud computing, parallelization, et cetera, et cetera, as, as, as we might be. I think that is changing. But I think we've also been limited in our software. And again, I think we have a problem with too much proprietary software, too much, I talked about my model. We also have my software. Uh, uh, we, we build things from scratch. Uh, I, I, I think limitations in our software are, are generating barriers to ourselves that we need to get over. Uh, again, in other fields, we see people building big labs. Uh, so the, again, if the computer and our, the software where in particular in the computer is our lab, uh, should we be generally building more general software that we can all use and all experiment with and share data and contribute towards? Instead of building our own little software,
software system? Should we all be contributing to something bigger? This is not a new idea, but we've never done it. Uh, but again, in other fields like physics, we see people, you know, everybody around the world getting to be, get, to be, get together to build the CERN, you know, or build the very large array. Um, and then we all benefit from it. Um, and my final comment is just, um, you know, I think travel demand models uh, uh, follow the same sort of technological growth curves as, as any other industry, any other technology, that, you know, you, improvements in performance come at a cost, and that cost tends to become exponential at some point. And so at some point, the only way you can do better is to jump off that technology curve, build a better most, most trap, drop down to a, a you know, a, higher performance at lower cost, and then ride that next curve. And I think that's something we need to be thinking about in terms of our models uh, and, and how successful we've been doing that and what might come next. Um, uh, I, I'm out of time, so I won't even try to summarize, but I think it's a brave new world out there, many opportunities. But just coming back to the question, I think we have to start replicating studies. I, I, when, when have you ever seen somebody replicate results from somebody else? Uh, or even you know, test the same model someplace else? It's, again, to publish the paper, your, your model has to be different than the next person's model because otherwise it's not new and unique. I do think we have to reject weak models. Uh, I think we have to find some convergence, more convergence than we have in our understanding of what some of the fundamental principles of the field are, uh, more transferability of parameters and so on. And, um, you know, uh, and uh, you know, many, many, Again, coming back to many, 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 many thank yous to all my mentors, all my colleagues, all the people we've worked with, but most importantly, I think in my case, my students. Uh, I really view this award is oh, an award to my students at least as much as it is to me because they're the ones that have really enabled everything and they're the ones that have made the journey worthwhile. Uh, this is not a complete list of all the students, but, but most of them, and it's certainly not a complete list of, the, of, the, of, of, of pictures of all, all the students, but, but again, this, this, this award is, is, is really Really, is really for you. There's a number of them in the audience here today, and uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, uh, to them for making all this possible. So again, thank you very much. I, uh, Tommy and I are both getting out of Dodge as soon as we can. After, uh, after no, I, we're both catching flights uh, no, early no after. Okay.